there are two things that I want to talk about, and they both come from the Entertainment Weekly issue that seems to be a San Diego Comic-Con on-location only type of thing, but there are articles out and about that you can get, one being from Apple News and some other places where you can get some of the uh, abbreviated articles, it seems. Um, and there are two quotes that stood out to me in those two things I want to talk about. So the first quote comes from, I think it's Patrick McKay. Let's go find this down here. Uh, right here. This is uh, Patrick McKay. We were not interested in doing a show about the younger version of the same world you knew where it's a little bit of a prequel. We wanted to go way, way, way back and find a story that could exist on its own two feet, which seems to be a talking point because that came out in a Variety article where it uses the exact same words, stand on its own two feet, which seems awkward because you're standing in Tolkien's shoes, so why would you stand on your own two feet? I digress. This was the one that we felt hadn't been told on the level and the scale and with the depth that we felt it deserved. I'm, I'm trying to figure out that other time that the story of Numenor and the Rings of Power, Celebrimbor and Elrond, all these characters was told without the depth that we felt it deserved. No, the, they're speaking to people who don't know anything about the Lord of the Rings, who don't know anything about Middle-earth and what Tolkien wrote. And they're telling us that this one deserves to be told. But here's the problem. This is not just one story. I mean, we're talking about the Rings of Power being forged circa, like right around, I want to say, 1500 in the Second Age, all the way to the fall of Numenor, which happens around, I was 3319, I think it is, in the Second Age. That's 1800 years. 1800 years that they're compressing down into a short span of five seasons. They could have easily taken the entire story of the Rings of Power, of the elves, of the dwarves, of how Sauron would come in and he would forge these these rings and convince them that he's a, um, that, that the treachery of his past is over and that he has come to unite now. Uh, Whereas Gilgalad was always the, uh, the the elven king who distrusted him, but he would swing the other the other races and the other leaders under his under his um, you know his wily ways, and right there you have a great story, and you could end it with the near defeat of Sauron, right when he retreats from Eriador and is is pretty much destroyed, right he's gone, but you have the great moments of Celebrimbor dying, of uh, Elrond's rise of even, you know, you could establish Galadriel in there some way. I wouldn't say make her the central point of your entire tale and make her the commander of the Northern Armies, but you get all these great characters in this long story of Sauron's treachery and the the distrust that he sows uh, and the faithful, well, not the faithful of Numenor, but the faithful ones who finally understood and how Celebrimbor came to the realization and forged the elven rings without him knowing. It's a great story, but no, 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 that wasn't enough. They had to go even further, right? They had to go all the way to the fall of Numenor. So you're taking these great stories that there are a lot of details in the Silmarillion. I mean, you could go all the way back and you wanted to to start with maybe how they became a seafaring power under uh, Erendis and Aldarion, right? Aldarion is the the, the king under, under Meneldur who, um, who, who essentially lost his love his his wife because he loved the sea too much and he created and established and became the uh, the um, uh, the great elf friend of Gilad. It is an un unfinished tale in the unfinished tales, but there are these other stories that you could create. And Amazon has lost a huge ability to create these great stories. Now, granted, they only have they only have the appendices, and perhaps that's the reason why. And perhaps that's why they had to compress this all down. But as a Tolkien fan, I can't, I can't accept that that's, that's the way the story is. I mean, there's 2,000 years, 2,000 years of actual tales that need to be told. And we don't get that here. Um, it's sad. I mean, I guess maybe one day we're going to be able to have that and we're going to be able to see that again. But it is not this day, to quote another famous line. Uh, in any case, here's the second quote that was important. This comes from J.D. Payne, who's the other showrunner, along with Patrick McKay. And this is what he said. It was one place that we were just laser focused on saying, we need to get this right. It's never been seen before. People have some ideas of what elves look like or what dwarves look like and what those kingdoms might look like. But Numenor was, in some ways, 
a blank canvas. In, in some ways, but you have Gondor, right? In some ways, uh, you have um, that they were inspired by the Eldar, uh, that this was reared out of the Valar, the, the whole island was, was, was brought out of the sea by the Valar. It, to say this is a blank canvas is kind of like saying, you know, let the past die, to quote a famous line from Star Wars, right? This means that we have the ability to write what we want within our system. So, so we get new things like here. Oh, here's Muriel, Queen Muriel, the Queen Regent now. Of, she's, the, she's the leader of Numenor. Which doesn't actually happen in the books, but she's the leader of Numenor. And certainly she does have the, uh, uh, she, she does have the heritage that leads her to that. But our Farazhan ends up becoming the king. And in here, she becomes the leader, the commander of the armies. And our Farazhan is simply an advisor when our Farazhan was the one who would travel over the seas and actually fight and was a commander. And to say that now we're changing this so that Muriel is a commander. And not only that, we're going to be getting, we're going to be getting a Galadriel right here on the shores of Numenor as well. So here she is, she's riding along the coastline with Elendil. Certainly seems like some sort of date they're on, but you know, that, that's all I can think about when I see a man and a woman who's a, an elf and a man. And there's another forbidden love, right? I mean, th we've already learned that Celeborn is no longer a part of this movie, the series. Um, and so we have Galadriel and, uh, and it's just sad. I mean, she never went to Numenor. There's no reason for that. There are, there are times where it was mentioned that the Eldar did travel to Numenor, but to have Galadriel explicitly go to Numenor, I mean, she was reluctant to leave Lorien. She was reluctant to, to go fight. Um, and to say that she was the one who was out there um, and traveled uh, <clears throat> to Numenor in order to help establish relations, to push them further into a war against Sauron, to tell them that the end is coming and... I'll be covered with Cheetos at some point, or maybe that happened in the past. We don't know. <laughs> in any case, it's, uh, it's a blank canvas to them. They can paint on it what they want to because it hasn't been painted enough. Again, they only have the appendices, and so the appendices are more of a canvas for them to paint on because you don't have all the specifics of the Silmarillion. You don't have all the specific of, specifics of the Unfinished Tales. You don't have all the specifics of the histories of Middle-earth. And that's sad. Because what we're going to get is we're going to get a compressed Rise of Skywalker-ish show. At least it feels that way. I will judge it when it comes out. Um, but all signs point to taking 1,800 years and compressing it down into one moment in time, into a few years. I mean, they could stretch it out to 10 or 20 years, but what's 10 or 20 years in a 3,300 long age, right? Three and a half millennia we're almost talking about. And they're taking it down to one point in time. So that's the first point. So the second thing I want to talk about is this information, this article that's come out that tells us how Simon Tolkien helped guide the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, and now that he serves as a series consultant for the show. Now we know that Tom Shippey, likely the leading scholar on Tolkien, his life and his works, now that Christopher Tolkien died a few years ago, uh, he was let go under unique circumstances where they say he broke his NDA, but there's some other information that's come out that said he was kind of pushing back a little bit too hard against them, and he, he wanted them to stick more closely to the stories that Tolkien created, and so he was whoosh, pushed out, and Simon Tolkien was brought in. Now, this is interesting because Simon Tolkien is indeed a director of the Tolkien estate, and I, I have actually had my run-ins with the Tolkien estate. And uh, back 20 years ago, they were very, very possessive of their, of, their, of their properties, right? I know this because I used to own the domain name Tolkien Online, and they didn't like that. After a few years, they came to me and they said, we'd like that back. And I said, you know, I'm not going to fight this battle because I don't think I'm going to win it and I don't have the money. So they own Tolkien Online. So if you go to Tolkien Online right now, it goes to the Tolkien estate. So I know that they, that they, they at least under Christopher Tolkien, they made sure that their properties that they could control 
were held very close to the vest, right? They wanted to make sure that they could uh, maintain control of anything with his name. But then Christopher Tolkien died. And Simon Tolkien became a, a director of the Tolkien estate. Um, and so we go through this article, how he is now on here uh, helping them out. Uh, and you go through this, it, it doesn't even give us any information about what he's been doing. So here's what's happening. Simon Tolkien is on there to lend credence to this series. We know that they're making this a blank canvas. And if it's going to be a blank canvas, what better way to say that the paint that we're using is Tolkien's own? And so they take Simon Tolkien. But here's the thing. Simon Tolkien, he was the only one, the only part of his family that actually uh, was okay with the films. Christopher Tolkien absolutely despised Peter Jackson's films. And you know, honestly, as a purist, I really didn't like The Fellowship of the Ring the first time I saw it either. I grew to accept it and like it and enjoy it for what it was. Um, part of me still wishes they'd never been made, but that's besides the point. Um, what Simon Tolkien did is he embraced the films and he went and met with Peter Jackson and he took all that um, and it caused a deep rift within the family that we can see right here. Um, he talks about uh, all his anger. He talks about all he ever was going to be he was the grandson of this very famous writer. Um, Eventually, he put things right with his dad, but there was this big, huge divide that um, was there. And so when Simon Tolkien comes on to the Rings of Power, it's not getting Christopher Tolkien. Simon Tolkien didn't have anything to do with all of Christopher Tolkien's works. I don't even see any information anywhere that says they're bringing him on to uh, help with any of the uh, the lore, any of the ideas about who the characters are or what his grandfather actually thought about them. So my takeaway is this. They know, they being Amazon, right? They know that they're creating something completely new. For instance, this picture right here of uh, Galadriel in a Numenor at their library, right, where all of their histories and pasts are. I'm pretty certain that certainly doesn't look elvish. So there's that. Um, but they're creating something brand new with a blank slate, with a clean canvas, and they're plugging in all the things that they want. They're plugging in Celebrimbor, they're plugging in Galadriel into Numenor. They're throwing in a new character like Disa, like uh, Halbrand. Um, they're creating all these things that we know weren't there. And, and we don't need a Simon Tolkien to tell us this is okay because we have everything. We have all the stuff. I mean, look, there are 12, is it 13 now? 12 histories of Middle-earth plus unfinished tales, plus notes, plus things that are still left being gone through like an archaeology dig, right? So we know there is so much there and they're not using any of it. They're barely using anything. They're going to the appendices and then whoo, they're whoa, they keep injecting all these characters. And that's what makes me really sad. I want to see what Tolkien wrote. I don't want to see what J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay think is a great idea and makes it stand on its own two feet because nothing, 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 nothing they ever do will stand on its own two feet like Tolkien's did. I, I urge you to go back and read The Silmarillion, read Unfinished Tales. I mean, the story of Aldarion Erendis, um, I reread that uh, just over the last couple of days. It's, it's a great story, but there are great stories, right? And there are unfinished tales, but to have this, to have a blank slate that new people who have no real knowledge of Tolkien are creating uh, is sad. And uh, I, hope, I hope I'm wrong. I hope it gets better. But all these notes, all these things that we see, uh, all these articles that are coming out that are somehow trying to justify it, trying to throw the Tolkien name in it with Simon Tolkien, who hasn't really done anything in his entire life uh, with uh, Tolkien's works, with his grandfather's works. He's only come on in the last few years, ever since he repaired his relationship with his father. So there's no, um, there's no depth that he's bringing to this that otherwise would not have been there. It's, you know, it's saying from the writers of or from the director who brought you that's the same thing they're doing with bringing simon tolkien on so so those are my thoughts let me know what you think hey if you did like it you know subscribe below give me a like share it um i really want people to read tolkien to get into his words and to not rely on peter jackson's films and to not rely on uh, jd payne and Patrick McKay and Amazon, right? Because there is no passion in what they're doing. There's no fire that draw, draws them forward. There's nothing that um, is going to be 
a true reflection of what Tolkien actually wrote in The Rings of Power. So go read the books. They're far better than anything you'll see on the screen. They're far more enjoyable. They're amazing. Uh, and, and nothing else in this world, in my opinion, is anywhere near as good as that fiction that he created in Middle-earth through the Silmarillion, through the Lord of the Rings, through Unfinished Tales, and through much of the histories of Middle-earth. Oh, and not to mention Baron and Luthien and the fall of Gondolin and um, my personal favorite, the children of Hurin. What a great story. Oh, man, if I could see that, if somebody would have the guts to bring that to the screen, that would be amazing. So anyway, all right, I digress. Subscribe, like, share. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you next time.